Hi everyone, let's carry on exploring the life of His Holiness the 13th Dalai Lama and his time in Mongolia. I wanted to pull out a bit from this more approachable book, The Story of Tibet, written by Mr. Thomas Laird, which I first finished and I remember him talking a lot about the background. And so I'll just start today's episode with this book. The 13th Dalai Lama was 28 years old when he rode into an exile that would last eight years. After three months of hard travel across northern Tibet, a wild, treeless, windy plateau, much of it above 16,000 feet, and then the Gobi Desert, over a distance of 1,500 miles, he arrived at last at today's Ulaanbaatar, Orga. In our previous episode, we called it Orga. Because of Mongolian devotion to the Dalai Lama, the Mongols received him very well. His relationship with monks and monasteries was excellent, the Dalai Lama XIV said. At this time in Mongolia, there was a tradition of the monks approaching a scholar and requesting a debating session with you, so he accepted such requests, and they would debate with him. Because of this, he spent a lot of time fiercely studying the scriptures, since he had to debate he had to study. He debated and won many times, often against many high-placed scholars. Later on, he spent time explaining Buddhist texts, not in the form of a public teaching, but very seriously explaining the philosophical text to a few monks. In fact, in Mongolia, he acted like a teacher, not like the Dalai Lama. When in Lhasa, the Dalai Lama gave public teachings, but otherwise he did not act like an ordinary teacher. So while the 13th Dalai Lama was in Mongolia, he carried out Dharma both informally and formally. In fact, I learned about this on one of my trips to Mongolia when one of the senior Mongolian monks told me how his teacher had received teachings from the 13th Dalai Lama in this way. His stay in Mongolia had a large influence on him, I inquired. Yes, he smiled. The sweepers told me that the 13th Dalai Lama also learned Mongolian and spoke it quite fluently, and the influence of wearing Mongolian dress was very strong on him. For the rest of his life, he wore the Mongolian dress. So anyway, in spite of the political situation and some misunderstanding with one Mongol priest, he developed a very special relation with the monasteries and the public. The Mongolians were very devoted to Buddhist teachers anyway, so they were very devoted to Dalai Lama. And what was happening politically between Britain, Tibet, and the Manchu while he was in Mongolia, I asked. The political side, I don't know. You will have to do the research. So back to this book that I was reading from in the previous episode. The 13th Dalai Lama's sojourn in Mongolia bore witness to a new relationship between Mongolia and Tibet, which was established in the 13th century. Subsequently, the governments of Mongolia and Tibet signed a treaty in 1913 recognizing each other's independence. Curiously, even the Mongolian People's Republic, a communist state founded in 1924, set up an embassy in Lhasa from 1926 to 28. However, with Mongolia's suspicion of the exiled Ninth Panchen Lama's activities in Inner Mongolia, a great purge against Buddhist institutions and lamas carried out in the 1930s, severed direct links between Mongolia and Tibet. And the same author wrote a chapter called Lamas to the Rescue, Tibeto-Mongolian Buddhism and Imperial Nationalism in Collaborative Nationalism, the Politics of Friendship on China's Mongolian Frontier, for those who are interested. Then he goes on to a literature review of different scholars, Russian, Chinese, who have written on the subject. And I learned about this resource in Chinese about the Qing Dynasty and some diaries written by people who witnessed the 13th Dalai Lama during his time in Mongolia, such as You Meng Ri Ji. Uh, these uh, Chinese archival materials are supplemented by a detailed Chinese language chronological biography of the 13th Dalai Lama based on the Tibetan language biography of the 13th Dalai Lama, which includes some information. The most scholarly publication that stands out for this author in Chinese is Wang Yuan Da's Jin Dai E Guo Yu Zhongguo Xizang. 
Based on extensive research on archival materials, Wong carefully reconstructed uh, Russian uh, activities in Tibet, devoting quite a few pages to the Dalai Lama's relationship with the Russian government, especially the role played by Buryat monks. There was, of course, nothing on the Mongol side of this story. So, the Mongol side of this story. The great game and the great cost. On 31st October 1904, the Captain General of Tushit Khan Aimag, which is a subdivision of administration in the Mongol regions, was informed by the Lamas in Orga that the 13th Dalai Lama was arriving at the banner of Grand Duke Yundun Dorji of Zasak Khan Aimag on the 10th of the last month of the year, and on the 20th he would reach the monastery of the Erdin Bandida Kutuktu of Sen Noyon Aimag. This was heard by the Mongol Lamas from the Tibetan Lamas, who must have been traveling ahead of the Dalai Lama. The excited Captain General sent an urgent message to the other three Hal Aimogs telling them that the Dalai Lama's visit to Hal Mongolia was a really an extremely marvelous event. The news of the 13th Dalai Lama's arrival also put the Qing government on alert. Yan Zhi, a newly appointed Amban of Xinin, was quickly redeployed as an imperial envoy to handle the issue of the Dalai Lama. Instructions were sent to the Jepsun Damba Kutuktu, the Mongolian spiritual leader, that the imperial envoy should be accorded the same courtesy and hospitality as shown to the Dalai Lama. The Mongol officials' initial excitement about hosting the Dalai Lama as an opportunity for merit-making soon faded as they sobered up to the hard reality of having to meet the enormous cost. His daily expenses were 1,000 tea bricks and 20 horses. In a document written in late January 1905, Tushik Khan Aimag complained that although Zasak Khan Aimag and Sain Noyon Aimag originally agreed to collectively contribute to the cost, they did not deliver anything. Two days later, Sain Noyon Aimag, Captain General, stated that 30 camel loads of grain were sent to Orga, pressurized by Tsetsen Khan Aimag and Tushit Khan Aimag. Zasak Khan Aimag responded by proposing to approach the Oryang Hai and Dorbet regions of Western Mongolia, appealing to their religious sensibility. Moral pressure was also exerted by the Manchu general-in-chief of Uliatsai, who urged the Mongol princes to abide by the master-disciple rule and pay up. Zasak Khan Aimag soon relented, delivering a small amount of a thousand tails of silver claiming difficulty due to natural disasters. The single most important job for the Qing government in the two-year period was to remove the Dalai Lama from Mongolia in order to squash any potential Tibetan alliance with Russia and with the Mongols. For his part, the Dalai Lama's journey in hope of obtaining the Russian support for his struggle with the British could not have come at a worse time as his arrival at Orga concluded with the most difficult crisis Russia was encountering, both internationally and domestically. Internationally, it fought a costly war with Japan, suffering a major defeat in the Battle of Mukden in Manchuria in 1905, losing 90,000 soldiers. Domestically, worsening economic and political problems in Russia led to popular unrest, and the Russian defeat in the hands of the Japanese triggered a major revolution in early 1905. Russia was forced to a peace agreement on September after on 5th September 1905 after the Russian navy was defeated by the Japanese at the Battle of Tsushima. Despite this debacle, Russia did not want to disappoint the Dalai Lama, but tried to keep him favorably disposed toward Russia while not rendering him any support. Throughout the spring and summer of 1905, the Dalai Lama had to juggle several balls, dealing with the great devotional worship of the Mongols and Buryats who rushed to Urga to get his blessing, and with the pressure put on him by the Qing government for an early departure while waiting anxiously for a favorable Russian response. The Qing, for its part, was careful not to be too heavy-handed with the Dalai Lama for fear of pushing him towards Russia or alienating alienating the Mongols.